Okay, hi, I think we can start. Thank you all for being here. I'm Akos and my co-presenter is Fabian. And in the next about half an hour, we're gonna start about, uh, we're gonna talk about accelerating Spark SQL queries on FPGAs using Apache Arrow and OpenCAPI. So first, uh, we're gonna dive into some of the challenges of accelerating big data analytics because this is a particularly challenging field involving many technologies and expertise. And then we're gonna take a look at Spark SQL and its integration with Apache Arrow. And we're gonna show a proof of concept application for you, which was already teased in the previous presentation from this lab by Yoast. So those who were there, you, you've seen it already. And then we're gonna look at the results and some lessons learned. Uh, so let's start. Uh, let's, let's look at the big data analytics, big picture. So uh, big data application developers usually like to work on uh, high, level, high levels, actually ever higher levels of abstractions. They are using frameworks that uh, offer distributed uh, execution, resilience, uh, fault tolerance, and all in all a very high level way to uh, uh, to uh, express the application, uh, most of the time it's going to be represented as a lazily evaluated data flow graph, for example, and the uh, framework takes care of the rest. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have the computing hardware, in this case an FPGA, uh, where you should present your design most of the time as a low-level hardware description, or you might be able to use some high-level synthesis tool but all in all, just the hardware development requires a wide range of expertise and we're not even talking about integration with higher level software frameworks. And in the middle, we have a knowledge gap that is, I think, still increasing, but the Accelerated Big Data System Group proposes a stack of tools to, uh, to close this gap, not to close, to make it easier to jump over it. So. Uh, let's see how an accelerated application looks like. So first of all, we need some kind of host side integration. And that includes the memory layout of the data uh, that we're going to use for the acceleration. Also, where is it in the memory and how can we access it? And we also need an API to interact with this uh, accelerator hardware. Then we have to choose a target platform, a host accelerator interface that basically defines how the uh, accelerator hardware is integrated into the rest of the system and how it interacts with it. Obviously, one of these uh, frameworks and technologies is OpenCAPI. Uh, and finally, we do have to design the accelerator hardware itself, including the control structure, we usually want some kind of performance scaling to run some design space exploration uh, on the hardware and arrive at an accelerator that satisfies all the design constraints. And most of the time, since engineering hours are expensive, we do want some IP reuse. We may have a lot of uh, IP cores that we already developed. Uh, you also already presented some uh, compressors, decompressors, filters, and all that. And we would like to reuse these in many use cases and streamline hardware development. So let's see where we are. There is a new movement in the big data world, uh, Apache Arrow, which aims to be a language agnostic uh, in memory data format across languages and frameworks. Uh, it's a columnar data format. So all the data with the same data type and uh, the data that resides in the same column are grouped together. It's also meant to be a hardware-friendly representation, mostly meaning that whenever it is possible, the data is stored in memory in a contiguous way. This uh, makes it a very good vehicle to feed data flow hardware because this way we can utilize the memory bandwidth as much as possible. Also, uh, by being a physical uh, definition, how the memory look, how the data looks like in memory. It offers uh, zero copy interprocess communications. And in this case, not just between frameworks and languages, between the host software and the accelerator as well. 
All right, so how can we use this? Uh, the Accelerated Big Data System Group has a framework called Fletcher, uh, which meant to bridge a huge gap uh, in this figure. It brings Apache Arrow data to the FPGA and allows the developer to read and write Arrow formatted data in memory. So as you can see in the high level uh, workflow, we have an application that reads and writes arrow record batches. Record batch is the abstraction, abstraction introduced by arrow for tabular data. Uh, based on this schema, the record batch is schema, which defines how the columns look like, basically what's the data type, what is the data type of every column, including that uh, Fletcher can generate uh, its interfaces and infrastructure and present the data to the developer and the accelerated algorithm. Uh, it's important to point out that uh, most of Fletcher's hardware is platform agnostic, but, and it supports open CAPI. Uh, the important point is that this data is not presented as bytes or memory words to the accelerated algorithm. The type of these interfaces are actually derived from the arrow schema. So when we request uh, data from the memory, we do not send uh, pointers or memory addresses. We operate with row indices. But let's take a look at what these interfaces look like. Uh, and that's something for Tidy, a recently released specification for representing uh, complex and dynamically sized data structures over hardware streams. So the issue here is in big data analytics, it is common to have uh, complicated data structures. Uh, for example, on the left, you can see a message that has a timestamp and has some text in its body. Uh, in software, you would represent this as a struct, for example. And if you look at the memory layout, it is typically uh, represented as a sequence of bytes or memory words, depends on how you look at it. But uh, whenever we go to hardware and we want to stream this data, we have to think about two resources, spatial and temporal resources. Spatial as in bits and temporal resources as in transfers. And uh, Tidy proposes a stream space abstraction to make this mapping in a formal way between uh, complex data structures in software to uh, streams in hardware. Right, so where are we? We have Arrow as a pretty good asset to integrate with higher level frameworks, uh, 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 data frame libraries and all that. We have Fletcher to bring this data to the FPGA and use it. We have Tidy to represent Arrow and uh, software data structures in hardware in an efficient and formal way. So what, do we, what are we missing? Uh, we miss a meaningful way to integrate with higher level frameworks because Arrow is just a data layer. We want something more automated to capture the algorithm or the application from this uh, very high level description and, and uh, develop or generate some hardware for it. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have Tidy to represent these data types, but we uh, still have to do the computation somehow. So either you have to develop your course in uh, HDR or with HLS or anything like that. And we have to bridge this gap. So let's start from the left and now I'm gonna let Fabian explain the Spark SQL part. Thanks, uh, also hello from my side. Uh, I am Fabian and I'm going to tell you how we have extended Spark to be able to call FPGA kernels. Spark is a general purpose cluster computing system which became quite popular in the last years and clearly is one of the most used tools in the big data community today. Our work is especially based on one specific module, on Apache Spark SQL. This module is built on top of the classical RDD API and it extends this functionality. It enables Spark to process structured data by letting the users define declarative queries such as SQL. With this approach, Spark SQL gets us a lot of information about the data and the query, and it can use this information to optimize the query before executing it. When integrating Spark SQL, we faced two main challenges. 
One challenge is to uh, modify Spark's data format so that the data is stored in the error format and we can avoid costly transformations. And secondly, we had to tell Spark that it actually executes our own code and not the internal default computation implementation. Traditionally, uh, Spark processes the data row by row. Uh, this means it loads one row into the memory, processes the row, and yeah, and now with uh, sorry. However, we rely actually on a batch processing because we want to use error and so we need to load the data in batches and process then one data batch. Uh, released in June 2020, Spark has introduced a new feature, the columnar processing support in public APIs. As you might know, uh, within Spark, the data set is split into so-called partitions. And this is Spark's way of paralyzing the computation because now multiple worker threads can process different partitions in parallel. With the new feature, this partition is actually, actually split further. And, and the new abstraction layer is introduced, the columnar batch. As you can see, now it's possible to load a whole chunk of data and process one chunk or one batch. Um, this, unfortunately, is not yet based on the error format. However, the concepts work quite well together with Apache Arrow. And uh, Spark SQL's columnar batch abstraction consists of multiple column vectors. And also here, Spark SQL already provides uh, implementation which is compatible with or which internally use the Apache Arrow abstractions. Now to the second challenge. How can we tell Spark to execute our own code, our own custom operators? I'm going to explain this on an example query, which is processed uh, within Spark SQL before the actual uh, execution. There are multiple ways of defining a query. Probably the most straightforward one is to define a SQL query, as here shown in the example. This query is then analyzed, validated, and optimized, optimized until it's finally stored in a Spark internal format, the so-called logical plan. As you can see here, this logical plan is actually a tree of operators. And I start by explaining the scan operator here in violet, which is responsible for reading the data. The filter operator in green, which filters out all records, not, filling the, uh, not fitting the expression. Uh, and then finally in yellow, a project operator, which only returns the fields we are interested in. After that, this logical plan is mapped to a so-called physical plan. Here on the slides, these plans look quite similar, but the physical plan actually describes now how the logical plan is executed. So we can say this is the actual implementation or one implementation of a logical plan. And that's actually the point where we can jump in and we can replace this physical plan with the own physical plan. So a plan containing our own operators in which we then can call, for example, Fletcher. And we have this actually done for one specific proof of concept. Our proof of concept use case is based on the Chicago taxi trip uh, use uh, data set, which is public available. This data set contains all taxi trips conducted since 2013. And as you can see here on the table, every record describes one trip and which is defined by multiple fields. For us relevant is the name of the company and the duration of the trip. Because our goal is to calculate the total duration of all trips conducted by companies starting with the letter B. This obviously is not a very complex analyst, uh, analytics query and this brings us to this very straightforward SQL query. What are we doing? We're reading the data from a parquet file and then we are summing up the durations of all trips which match and regex. And in this case, the regex means all trips, uh, all trips where the taxi company starts with the letter B. Spark maps this now internally to a physical plan here shown in the center of the slides. I'm going, going to describe it bottom up uh, with the blue part. There we have a parquet reader in, uh, which uh, imports the data from a parquet file. 
And this operator is actually already in the columnar format by default. And therefore, Spark adds here this operator in yellow, which automatically converts the columnar format into the classic row-based format. And then these rows are filtered by the operator in violet. And with the green part, then uh, the duration of the trips is summed together. Important to notice is here that this summing uh, requires actually exchanging data between multiple partitions or between multiple um, worker threads, and therefore a network exchange is required, shown here with the shuffle operation. So, as I said before, we have now replaced this physical plan with a custom physical plan with our own implementation. First of all, we have replaced the parquet reader with a custom parquet reader, which actually directly loads the data in the error format so that we don't, do not need to convert the data when we want to call Fletcher. And now the most important operator is now the Fletcher operator. It takes as an input the stream of batches and calls an FPGA kernel for every batch. Uh, in our use case, uh, this kernel takes one batch and sums up the duration of all tri uh, trips within this batch. So we kind of get an intermediate sum, which is then um, summed together with the default mechanism of Spark here still shown in green. I want to present you now a bit uh, in detail the Fletcher operator. Fletcher, the Fletcher framework provides the runtime to integrate FPGA accelerators with software. It currently exists, for example, in C++, and therefore we are calling it by using uh, the Java native interface from the Java side, aka from Spark. And this operator processes multiple batches, and so we basically do a computation for every batch. And as you can see, we firstly have to transfer the data from the Java side to the C++ side. But actually, we can make use here of the Apache Arrow language agnostic um, feature. Meaning we only need to copy the addresses from the Java side to the C++ side, and then we can construct the error abstractions again in C++. And now we are uh, referencing from both sides to the actually same data and no copying was necessary. As soon as we have the C++ abstractions, we are ready to call uh, our FPGA kernel by using Fletcher. And as I said, this kernel is then uh, returning the intermediate sum, which is then at the end um, combined together by Spark. I return now back to Akosh, who is going to tell you how we can build FPGA kernels way more efficient. So back to the hardware side, but let's zoom out a bit first. So you might recognize this. This is the special case of the general fresher workflow. Now we have a Apache Spark application. In this case, uh, it writes uh, an error record bash that has two columns, a string array and an integer array. And based on this schema, we can generate the Fletcher infrastructure. And uh, Fletcher is going to supply two incoming streams to our kernel, one of which is a string stream. The other one is an integer stream and we're going to return the uh, results as well. In this case, uh, since we're at an open power conference, the uh, interface that's being used is open uh, So how would the kernel look like? What the kernel would look like? Uh, as we said, we have the seconds uh, incoming, that's an integer value, and we have a list of company names that is a list of strings. Uh, we do want to filter for specific companies that, uh, that match a regular expression. We use a regular expression measure for that. That's going to generate a predicate stream, which is basically a Boolean stream uh, that is true when the particular company name matched. The other incoming stream is, got, uh, is fed into a filter stream construct that is going to filter the incoming integers based on that uh, Boolean predicate stream. Uh, this filter, these filtered values are then fed to the reduce stream construct, which uh, instantiates a sum operator and sums all the values together 
and then we return uh, that singular value for, for an array. All right, but how can we build this uh, efficiently? Uh, let's say we want tidy interfaces for all of these blocks, because at least now we have a standard to do this. We want to define operations on these streams and interfaces. We also want to instantiate library components, such as the regular expression matcher. And it would be great to have hardware templates for, for uh, regular computations, for filters, map, reduces. And to handle this, uh, we propose a new language called Tido for Tidy. And it's basically a data flow composition language featuring these. So let's look at uh, this particular accelerator in this language. At the top, you can see the generated dot diagram by the tool. It has exactly the sa uh, same three stages uh, as I showed earlier. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see the, uh, the description. So we define a structural implementation for this kernel. We instantiate streamlets, which are basically the data, for, data flow components that have interfaces adhering to the tidy specification. In this case, this is a regular expression measure that takes a parameter that is the regular expre expression. And then we make data flow connections between these modules. And we also instantiate uh, two uh, hardware templates, uh, namely the filter stream and the reduce stream pattern. And these are what's called parallel patterns that sound familiar from functional languages. And these are actually really good constructs for one-to-one -one mapping between uh, Spark data flow graphs or, or, or any kind of computational graphs to hardware. And as you can see, it's nine lines of readable codes. Uh, if you want to do this in VHDL, that would be around 600 lines of boilerplate VHDL. Uh, this is excluding comments and, and all the components. This would be just the instantiation and connection of the components. Uh, let's see some results. So we implemented this end to end. We chose the string stream to be able to transfer at most 20 bytes per cycle. In this case, that is 20 characters because we're talking about ASCII. And this kernel was able to achieve 135 million records per second. It can process that many. Uh, in this data set, that accounts for around four gigabytes per second throughput. Uh, the whole design uh, took about 20% of the whole FPGA from which Flasher and the kernel I presented to you accounts for only about three and a half percent. Running this application, we've seen an overall speed up of 8x, uh, as you can see on the graph as well. The actual FPGA compute is even lower than that. The FPGA other you can see there is basically the IO reading the Parquet file. Uh, if we want to saturate the open capy bandwidth, that means six of these kernel would need to be instantiated. Uh, and that would easily fit into the FPGA as, as, you can, as you can see. And even considering that most of the hardware would be shared. So the OCX accelerated hardware would be shared. Uh, some of the fresher infrastructure would be shared. We would just uh, have to instantiate the kernel multiple times. Uh, so let's see what have we achieved here. Now we have a complete workflow for accelerating big data workloads, starting from high level framework down to the FPGA hardware design. We also looked at uh, integration with Apache Spark. We presented a proof of concept accelerator that achieved ATEX speed up on this particular application. Uh, and we proved that by choosing suitable abstractions in every layer, it is actually possible to go very far with structural hardware composition without, without many high-level synthesis magic. Uh, the language we presented uh, allows us to map data flow components uh, to hardware using library components and hardware templates. These hardware templates are a very good match to represent big data analytics uh, computations in hardware. Uh, if you want to develop your kernel by hand, this offers you a code size reduction. Uh, or 
if you want to utilize this in your own tools, this is actually a good internal representation for code generation and synthesis tools. And with this, I would like to conclude and we're open for questions. Thank you very much. Let me pop on the Q&A. Uh, you did not use OC Accelerate. This, uh, this is a question. Uh, we did, it's hidden by Fletcher. So uh, it's, it's one of the Fletcher backends and, and supported uh, targets. So Fletcher wraps it around. Okay, we, we got a question. Uh, and it's about versus one worker thread. So yes, I, I leave this to Fabian to explain. This is, yeah. this is actually a very good question. Uh, Akos, can you maybe go back to the slide with the um, partitions, Spark partitions? Sure. Um, here we go. Yeah, we have the, the bit of problem. How does uh, Spark doing parallelism? And it does this actually by um, doing by splitting the data set into partitions. And now we have multiple worker threads, uh, which process this one uh, partitions in in parallel. And where we now actually worked on, we worked more on um, yeah on making the processing of one partition fa faster. And this is done here now. Uh, by calling the FPGA within one partition, in, within one worker thread. Um, but here, for sure, it will be still possible to put another layer of parallelism, so to call multiple um, batches, process multiple batches in parallel. And in general, we can, we can say that it's possible to, to replace with um, one FPGA. In our example, it was we, we could replace one, yeah, one worker 48. thread. Yeah. Sorry. If it's for, no, go, go ahead, Akos. Uh, so, so you can look at it in another way. So this is an 8x performance improvement and we compared it to one CPU thread because uh, you basically do a polarization in Spark by splitting the data into multiple partition and partitioning them independently. So you can look at it in a way that you can replace eight CPU cores uh, with one kernel in this case, because it would be easy to instantiate more and feed data independently into those. Um, the next one is how difficult uh, to use multiple kernels. Currently we don't have, uh, it is possible to do uh, manually. It doesn't have, we don't have the language construct for that currently, but we can define those and, and that would be possible. Although in certain types of computations, you would need a software support for this. And about can the language support tiling and DSC stuff. Uh, so we don't instantiate multiple kernels at this time. You can run design space exploration currently on how wide the streams should be because uh, you can choose how many elements you want to transfer uh, at most in, in one transfer in these streams. And obviously you do have to choose that carefully. Right. Fabian, do you want to go ahead and answer the parquet question? Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm going yeah, to we'll answer the next that. question right. also. Um, it asks about the, the parquet file. And we started here with the most simple case. Um, so the parquet file is uh, not compressed and it's also not using uh, dictionary encoding. So yeah, that the uh, mapping into the error format is the easiest possible, so, yeah. Okay, so I think we hit 30 minutes. Uh, we're gonna be still here since there's gonna be a break, uh, but you can reach us on, on, uh, on Slack as well Slack. after this. Yeah.
and thank you again for attending.